As Wayne said, my name is Mark Ryland. Um, I am a professional inventor. I've been a professional inventor for over 30 years. I was an inventor for the National Security Agency for 17 years. Who would have thought NSA would have inventors, but they do. And professional inventors are nothing more than people who found a way to make money at it. And if you're lucky enough to be able to make a living at it, it can be a very good living. But it's kind of like custom cars. You can make millions of dollars. You can end up with a large for or a small fortune in custom cars, but you have to start with a large fortune and let it whittle itself down. One guy got that. One guy <laughs> way in the back got that. So I was here on business this week, and Wayne asked me if I'd come by and talk about licensing. Uh, as Wayne mentioned, I write a blog, the Inventor Education blog. I've written it for eight years, Monday through Friday, five days a week. Unlike a lot of the professionals in the industry, uh, I don't sell things to inventors. I don't work with inventors. I've got no horse in your race. And so I tell you what you need to hear, not necessarily what you want to hear. That's important because I've gotten a front row seat to the calamity of this industry for many, many years. And I learned a long time ago, this is nothing to mess with. If you're willing to do the work, you can be successful in this industry. But you have to understand, A, it's an industry, and two, it's all about your determination and the amount of work you're willing to put into it. To, to frame that properly, if we took the inventing industry and we signed a, ge a, ge a geometric shape to it, what would that shape be? Anyone have an idea what the shape of the inventing industry is? Polyhexadedron. How'd you know that? <laughs> it's a pyramid. We're a pyramidally shaped industry, which means we have a very broad base and a very small top. Everyone comes in through that base. And you move through different stratas until you reach the point of professional inventor. That is, you make your living inventing. Very few people who come in through that base will ever have the tenacity to do the work it takes to get to the top. That's why it's pyramidally shaped. The vast majority of them will hang around at the bottom with this great idea. Well, let's face facts. Anyone who's ever taken a shower has had a great idea. That's not rocket science. So you have to understand where you are in that pyramid and where you're willing to go. That's hugely important. I can tell you this without hesitation. The vast majority of people who get into this industry fail and leave. The question is not whether they'll fail. The question is how much damage they'll do in the process. In fact, let me put that in perspective for you. The average independent inventor that says, I've got a great idea, honey. I think I can watch Shark Tank and make this work is going to lose on average about $100,000. Everyone in their path has their handout from the website person to the graphic designer to the packager to that manufacturer who said, you're brilliant, here let me sell you a container full of crap. All these people have their handout and on average that will cost about $100,000. Now we hear all the time about these invention submission companies. And let's face it, we as an industry have an issue with that. But if you took the worst, the absolute worst invention submission company, and you bought every single thing that they had to sell you, you couldn't spend 20 grand. We're in an industry where it's cheaper to go get ripped off than it is to try and do this on your own without the right education. That's why education is so important. It's the antidote to that emotion. It's how we ground ourselves. So, one of the things that we try and get inventors to understand is there are two tracks. We have to invent, and then we have to go do something with it. In fact, we hear these terms thrown around all the time, innovation, invention, product development, entrepreneurship. Anybody know what innovation is? We hear that term all around. What's innovation? New way of doing something. New way of doing something? Anybody else? 
Innovation is the presentation of a hypothesis. That's all it is. I present a theory. I innovate. It's the bottom of that pyramid. It's ideation. If Thomas Edison walked in here today and said, look, I think I can take this glass bulb, put a filament in it, apply power to it, and draw a vacuum in the bulb, and it will light up, we would all look at him in utter amazement. We'd go, man, that is awesome, Tom. But can you hand me that candle? Because we're still in the dark. You didn't do anything to further our society. You didn't do anything to prove what you say is true. You proffered a theory, and that's awesome. It all starts with a theory. But it wasn't until Thomas Edison went into his lab and he started tinkering that he was able to invent because there, in invention, he proved his theory. Invention is proving a hypothesis. Now, just to be clear, Thomas Edison did not invent the light bulb. The light bulb had been invented many years before Thomas Edison. In fact, the light bulb you see today was invented 10 years after Thomas Edison gave up on the light bulb. But why do we credit Thomas Edison with the invention of the light bulb? Because Thomas Edison invented the one piece of the light bulb that made it work, and that's the screw base. One day walking into his lab, he looked down at an oil can and was inspired by the screw on the top of the oil can. If we did not have the screw base on the light bulb, we as consumers never would wire up an individual light bulb. So what Thomas Edison contributed was the important part of the invention, which was the commercial viability. Because without the commercial viability, we as consumers couldn't adopt it. The Wright brothers did not invent the airplane. The airplane had been invented long before them. What they invented was a control mechanism that gave commercial powered flight viability because now you could control it. So we as a society give them that credit because they made the largest impact. They made the one impact that gave it viability. Henry Ford tinkered with automobiles as a kid but never built a car in his life. He did not invent the automobile. He didn't even invent the assembly line. He stole it from the meat packers in Chicago. He brought the two together giving the product viability. Viability is an important part of every invention. If your invention doesn't have viability, if your innovation doesn't have proof, then you're never going to commercialize it. So we have innovation, I'm going to present a theory. We have invention, I'm going to go to my basement and prove my theory. Then we have product development. Product development is the transformation of the proof of your theory into something that the consumer can understand using the learned skills of engineering and design. A product developer, somebody went to school and learned how to do engineering and design, and now they're going to transform the proof of your theory into something I as a consumer can understand. And of course after that is entrepreneurship. So once I walk out of my basement proving my theory, inventing time is over. There's no more inventing. Everything past that is business. And that's where 99% of the inventors go wrong. So one of the things that we focus on is getting inventors to understand there are easier ways to do that than getting into the widget business. And one of those is licensing. Licensing your idea, your proven idea often, most of the time, to a company who is already in the business side of things because that's the part where you're going to fail. That's the part where you're going to drag your family down. That's the part where this thing goes south quickly. In licensing, we recognize the fact that when we walk out of the shed, we're done. We're going to hand it to somebody else and let them run down the road that they know, and we're going to go back to the shed and do something else. And that's really, really important. So, what's the definition of product licensing? The process of allowing a company or individual to use, rent, or otherwise lease the developed or undeveloped, patented or unpatented product or idea. 
Now this is really important. Developed or undeveloped, patented or unpatented, product or idea, in exchange for the consideration of royalties. That is licensing. In a nutshell. These are the two biggest myths to licensing. You can't license an unprotected idea to a manufacturer, totally garbage. And a fully developed product is worth more, more garbage. Best we can tell, less than 20% of retail products have any patent protection whatsoever. If myth number one were true, our shelves would be empty. We've been awarding patents since the late 1700s. It is very difficult to get patent protection on most retail products because it's already been given out, because most of what we invent today is a better way of doing something we invented a long time ago. A fully developed product is not worth more in a licensing deal because the, that's the business they're in of developing products. So why would I want to go and license my container full of stuff in the backyard to a company? All they're going to do is redo it using their knowledge and experience, which is significantly more than our knowledge and experience. So let's let them do what they do. These two things drive a lot of what inventors are spending money on. Step one, refer back to what you learned about how to invent and what makes a good product. Oh, refer back to what? Refer back to your education. Remember, you're going to get in this and you're going to do this. It's your responsibility to know what makes a good product. I hear this all the time. Oh, Mr. Ryan, how do you get a company to pay attention to your product? Well, that's easy. Have a good product. They will beat themselves up getting to you. I promise. Because their machine is insatiable. It never quits eating. But it's picky about what it wants to eat. So the onus is on you to understand what makes a good product. You have to learn the things about what makes a good product, the relationship between benefits and detriments in a product, the concepts of, of workarounds, the consumer use cycle, all of these things. And if you go to the blog, there's 1,500 articles on this stuff, all for free. Read your hearts out. I write about this stuff every day. You have to understand those things so that you can make a good product. And nine times out of 10, probably 9.9 .9 times out of 10, the problem an inventor's having and not getting licensing is because their product simply doesn't make any sense. It isn't consumer viable. Or in some case, it defies physics. <laughs> Step one, we've got to go learn what makes a good product. That's our foundation. Step two, we got to figure out what kind of neighborhood this product's going to live in. Now, a couple years ago, I moved to Charleston, South Carolina. Anybody here ever been to Charleston? It's a great town. I'd never been to Charleston before. Just moved there on a whim. I could have gone gotten a realtor or looked around and found a house and bought it and moved in. But I wouldn't know how far the grocery store was. I wouldn't know how far the fire department was. I wouldn't have known any of those things. It later would very, become very important to me. The same is true with the neighborhood that your product is going to live in. So to do that, we first have to understand that neighborhood. We have to understand the market. So we conduct what we call a market audit. Now this is not rocket science. What I'm looking for here are things that match functionally my idea or my product. I say functionally. One of the most important things an inventor can ever do is understand the concepts of functional inventing. In functional inventing, we strip away the paradigms. What's the functional, um, the core function of a water bottle? Portability. I'm sorry? Portability. Portability. Hold water. Functional invention of a, or functional, core function of a water bottle. 
Containment of mass and orderly movement of mass it has nothing to do with water. It's a containment and orderly movement of mass. That's its core function. So I would, I would present to you that a 55 gallon drum is also a water bottle, as is a kid's juicy box or a milk carton or a beer pitcher. They are all water bottles. So if I asked you 20 minutes ago to invent me a new water bottle, I guarantee you would have come back with these clones of what you social, sociologically think is a water bottle. And real inventors, especially good product inventors, learn to strip all that away and look at the core function of that product. Because that's going to unshackle your mind to create a better water bottle. So the core function is what we're looking for in this market audit. So here I've got examples of pizza cutters. So I'm going to look for every pizza cutter on the market that I can find. And I'm going to just make a simple chart. And I'm going to find out the retailer they're selling in, the package type they're using, the size and weight, the display kind, the color, all of that information and their price. And I'm going to matrix all that out, and I'm going to get myself about a 30,000 foot view of the pizza cutter market. Then I'm going to take a look at my pizza cutter, and I'm going to compare it to the market. Now there might be 50 pizza cutters out there, so I have to be honest with myself and ask myself the question, does the world really need 51? And the answer to that is probably no. And I have to have the fortitude as an inventor to walk away from my great pizza cutter idea if the market shows me that the consumers are currently being serviced well. Now, if I don't find any pizza cutters out there, that's every bit as troubling a, an answer. Because now I have to find out why. And that's normally about first sale versus second sale versus subsequent sale. There's a lot of dynamics that go into why something as, obviously, as obvious as a pizza cutter may not actually be out there. It's up to you to find that out. You will never know that until you do this process. One of the most important pieces of this is the pricing because that's how we develop an MSRP. MSRP is not just a number you come up with or as most inventors think you start working backwards from your manufacturing costs. It has nothing to do with that. An MSRP is the amount of pain the consumer is willing to experience. They're telling you how much a pizza cutter is worth to them. So at the end of all this, I'm going to take my idea for a pizza cutter, I'm going to compare it to each one of these and I'm going to write down a couple of things mine does better and a couple of things mine does worse. Because I have to figure out where in this strata of $5.95 to $31.95, those are the numbers the consumer has told me they're willing to bear for that solution. Because my pizza cutter may look like a pizza cutter. But what it is, is actually just a wrapper for a solution to a problem my consumer's having. My consumer's pizza is huge. They need to make it smaller. I've given them a way to make it smaller. That's it. They have a problem. They look around for a solution to the problem. They can't find that solution at home. They go to the repository of solutions, Walmart. The great repository of solutions, because that's all a retailer is. It is a giant warehouse of solutions. I go in there, I look around for my solution, I can't find an adequate solution, I go home, my problem didn't disappear. It's still here. So I gotta solve it on my own, and next thing you know, I'm at the Tampa Bay Inventors Group. Because that's how we all got here. We found a problem there was no solution to, so we came up with one. Understanding what the consumer is willing to pay for the solution you came up with to their problem, hugely important in all of this. Because none of the rest of it matters. 
That's your starting point. I don't care how much you paid for manufacturing. I don't care how much your website cost. I don't care how much the titanium you decided to make it out of was. This is what will, will be supported and you have to work within those numbers. And unless you conduct an audit, you don't know what those numbers are. And if you ever do make it to a retailer and you don't have this kind of backup to support your, your MSRP, they're going to laugh at you. They're going to be very nice about it. They're going to shake your hand and wish you well. And you're never getting in there again, I promise. Because they don't have time for it. And there's 15 other people just like you lined up down the hall who did take the time to do this kind of research. So in step two, we're going to understand the market. We're going to make sure that the world needs my idea or my product. And we're going to be honest with ourselves. I don't care what your dog told you. You have to be honest with yourself. Based on what you found in that audit, does the world really need your product? If it doesn't, you stop and you move to your next one. And you do this process again. But if you're not honest with yourself, you're just going to go down a path that's going nowhere. And that's really, really important. So in step three, we got to check ourselves. We know what our problem is. We know the solution we came up with. We know what the market says about it. Now it's time to really take stock of what we're saying. We're all the way to step four, and nobody's even mentioned the word patent. Not once. Why? Because getting a patent on your great idea is not the most important thing you can do, I assure you. There is no, zero, nine, nada, whatever language you want to say, it, no correlation between patent protection and commercial viability of a product. Nothing. It's just how we feel as individuals and all the war stories we hear and all this, the, the, you know, horrible things we hear about people stealing our inventions that make us want to run from the shower, towel off, and go to the patent office. But that's actually not how it's done. Once we understand our idea, once we understand the solution it's solving, and once we understand what the market says about it, then we're going to look for it. Because up until that point, I didn't have to talk to anybody. And after writing down, other than maybe my notebook, I didn't have to go take a survey. I didn't have to do anything. So protection up until this step hasn't been really on the radar because I'm just quietly doing my research. So these are the three prominent ways we're going to protect it. And they go from free to cheap to more expensive. The cheapest way you can protect your idea is shut your mouth. Be careful about who you talk to, and when you do explain things, write down who you talk to in the environment, the date in which you talk to these people. Keep a record. Just keep it in the back of your notebook. That'll be very important later on if you ever have to do something legal with your invention, even licensing it out. Say you have a company that says, man, this is great, but our attorney wants to know who you've told. Oh, here you go. Here's everybody I discussed it with. That's important. An NDA. Anybody downloaded an NDA off the internet? Come on. Bad, 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 bad idea. Why is downloading an NDA off the internet a bad idea? Because the enforcement of NDAs is done state by state, not federally. So some states have things in the NDA that they have to have for that NDA to be a legal document. So if I download an NDA off the internet that I found on ndas.com and I try and enforce it in the state of South Carolina, it may or may not hold any water. NDAs create trade secrets. Trade secrets 
are about civil liability that's done under contract law at the state level. Not like a patent which is done at the federal level. An NDA is enforced at the state level. So you have to have an NDA that works in the state in which you reside. And the best way to get that is to go to an attorney, spend a few bucks saying, write me an NDA that is enforceable in the state of Florida. You only have to do it once because then you can fill in the blanks on the NDA all day long. But at least then you know the one you're using will protect you should you ever need it. And of course a patent, everybody wants to get a patent. Anybody have any idea what an uncommercialized idea is? It's a hobby. Anybody have any idea what a patented uncommercialized idea is? An expensive hobby. An expensive hobby. Mm -hmm. That's right. I have a friend over in Fort Lauderdale who's got 57 patents, God love him. 57 patents. He's an orthopedic surgeon. He's 72 years old, he sees 60 patients a day. You know why he sees 60 patients a day? Because he's addicted to inventing. And the minute he doesn't see those patients, the bank's going to take his home. Because his $3 million house is, is mortgaged out to about $7 million to pay for his inventing habit. Now, we would all agree as an orthopedic surgeon, he's a really smart guy. Or is he? Right? Less than 50% of patents ever award. The average cost of a U.S. patent, a utility patent, is about $12,000. That's $12,000 that I'm going to give you for a less than 50-50 shot that three and a half years from now it will award. Something about that doesn't add up. I would be looking for cheaper ways to gain protection for my invention than running off and filing a utility patent. That may make you feel good. That may sound really cool at your next dinner party. But mathematically, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So, in 1995, the U.S. Patent Office instituted provisional patents. Anybody in here have a provisional patent? Yeah? Really? There's no such thing as a provisional patent. Application. It's an application. It never matures to a patent. Ever. If you choose, you can convert your, the content of your provisional patent application to a utility patent, not a design patent, to a utility patent within 12 months. But in order to enjoy that earlier date, you can only use the information that you put in your application. If you add more things, the old stuff gets the early date, the new stuff gets the new date. Provisional patents are a great little tool. I know people who refile their provisionals every 12 months just so they can print patent pending on their product. You can do it for 100 years if you want. You have to understand how these tools work and have what you need for your situation. The vast majority of people licensing a product out to a manufacturer should file for a provisional patent application right before they're ready to start approaching companies so that you have that full 12 months to work with. If after 12 months you haven't licensed it out, chances are you need to go back to the drawing board and figure out what's wrong with your product. But like all legal things, you should contact your attorney and ask for legal advice. It's really important. Step five, we need to understand some terms. A manufacturer is one who makes products. Couldn't tell you the number of times I hear inventors go, oh, well, I'm going to license this to Target. Really? Let me know how that works out. Target doesn't license things, neither do any retailers. Manufacturers who make products license things. A contract is a set of divorce papers. That's what it is. Contracts are great when you first write them because everybody's in love. You write the contract for that time when you're not in love anymore. 
We see this all the time when two neighbors get together over a bottle of wine on a Friday night and by 10.30 they've got the next great invention of the world. By Sunday they're at each other's throats. We see this constantly. You have to have a contract and understand the role that contract plays in this process. It is your divorce decree. A licensor, one who grants a license, that would be you. You're going to grant a license. A licensee is one who assumes a license. That would be the company you're approaching. Remember, we said licensing is like renting or leasing. It's a temporary authority. In fact, it's really just a temporary authority saying, I won't go beat you up. Right? It's not really giving them the right to do anything. It's telling them that when they do do it, you won't go beat them up. That's the crooks of a licensing agreement. And a royalty is a percent of per unit value off the adjusted net. So that means if I sell 100 pieces to Walmart, I'm the manufacturer, I sell 100 pieces to Walmart, 20 of them get returned, then you're only getting your royalty on 80 pieces, not 20, because 20 of them got returned. That's what we call adjusted. That's what the royalty is based on. So these are important terms. We need to understand those. So now, we've got our market audit, we've protected it, we understand the terms of the world we live in in licensing. <clears throat> now we need to develop a little sell sheet. Anyone ever seen a real retail sell sheet? It's a very complicated form. It has a lot of information on it, and it is done in a very specific way. That is not what we're talking about. This is, a, this is an example of a normal retail sell sheet. We're talking about a manufacturer sell sheet. So in a manufacturer sell sheet, what do we got? We got a picture. Now that picture could be a photograph of your prototype. It could be an artist rendering. It could be whatever you want. It could be a hand-drawn sketch if that's all you've got to work with. We've got a little paragraph here that kind of explains things. We've got a few bullet points, the capabilities of the product, and we've got your contact information and maybe your current patent status. And you'd be amazed at how many inventors do a sell sheet and never put their name on it. It's amazing. And that's all we've got. And when we contact the manufacturer and say, hey, we've got an idea we'd like you to look at, this is all we send them. Now think about that from a protection standpoint. I can tell you a whole lot about the fact that I'm building a motorboat without tell you, telling you how I'm building a motorboat. The fact that I'm building a motorboat is not rocket science. My invention is in how I built the motorboat. So we're not telling you how I built this year. We're not telling you those things. And then understand that the less sophisticated your idea is, the less this theory applies, right? This is a pizza shear. You don't have to tell me what you're doing to, for me to know how to build one. But if you have a relatively complicated product, you're not giving away how you did it, you're just saying that you did it and what the benefits of doing it were. So we're gonna take this sell sheet and now we're going shopping. In step seven, we're going shopping. Why are we going shopping? Because the federal government is your friend. And the federal government passed a law that says <clears throat> all manufacturers or distributors of retail products must mark them with their names. So I get this question all the time. Well, how do I get the holder know what company to approach? Go shopping. Go to the aisle that has all the stuff that's most like your idea. 
take the packages, flip them over, and take a, pack, a picture of that information with your cell phone. Because if this is a product that's closest to my idea, chances are this guy is the guy who I'm going to license it to. And the information's right there for me. You'd be amazed at how much stuff on an aisle is done by one or two companies. It's amazing. So I'm going to go shopping with my audit data and I'm going to start looking for products that are close proximity to mine. Or solve the same core function as mine. And I'm going to get the distributor or manufacturer information off the back of those packages and I'm going to go home and I'm going to put them in the spreadsheet. Then I'm going to have a pretty good starting place to contact the companies that I think might license this product from me. Then I'm going to contact each company. Hi, I've developed a product. After seeing that you distribute or manufacture these products, in this category, I wonder if you had a process for submitting products to your company for review. Wow, it's kind of intuitive. If a company has a process for submitting products to them for review, show them enough respect to use it. If they do not, ask them how you go about submitting something. If they say yes, ask them if they mind signing your NDA. That's not going to hurt. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Keep in mind, that NDA is a contract. And if someone called you up one afternoon and you were watching as the world turns and went and answered the phone, and they said, do you mind entering into a contract with me? How likely are you to say yes? But they have to protect your information contractually for the length of that NDA. I hear that a lot too. Well, if a company was really serious, they wouldn't have an expiration date on their NDA. Really? Think about that for a second. How could they reasonably protect that data with changing employees for the next hundred years. They couldn't do it. That's why an NDA has a date on it. It has to be reasonable to enforce it. Otherwise, it's not even a contract. So, if they don't want to sign your NDA, that doesn't mean they're crooked or they want to steal your idea or they're jerks. It probably means their attorney won't let them do that with people that just are voices on the other end of the phone. So if they say no, respectfully, respectfully thank them for their time and hang up. Now this is a really, really, really important word. Why? Because I don't know if you've noticed, but we got a lot of nut jobs in this business. We got some real nut jobs. Right? So we have to be respectful to those companies because we're representing our whole industry. And think about this. Say you call up Coleman Camping Products and you've got a great product. But 20 minutes before you called, some nut job called. And they thought they had a great product too. And they threatened to burn this guy's house down because he wouldn't sign their NDA. How likely are you to get your product into the, that company? So we have to act with respect because we don't know who we're following or who's going to follow us. And that's what the business world expects. They expect us to have done our homework, to know what we're doing, to understand what they need as new products, and to act with respect. Yes, sir. This whole thing, and you had a question about respect? No. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, listen to this. <laughs> What percent of like the big companies uh, will not want to sign your NDA? That's There's no point. way to answer that because every company is different. Mm -hmm. Some companies will look at it and go, okay, well, you know what, we'll sign a quick NDA. Or they'll have you sign their NDA 
because chances are your NDA doesn't include a clause that says they may already be working on your great idea, right? And that happens a lot, especially in the toy industry. And so they may say, I'm not gonna sign yours, but we'll sign ours, you know? Or they may say, oh, well, we want a clause put in yours that says, what if we're already working on this? You know, we're not gonna get drug into court or plastered all over the internet as, as crooks simply because you didn't know two years ago we started working on this. And that happens a lot. So there's no way to tell what com a company is gonna do unless you ask. But the more respectful you ask, the better your chances are of doing, of getting them to do it. Yes, sir? Well, what if what they want you to sign uh, basically states that the only protection you have in sending it to them is any current or future intellectual property that you have on it, mm -hmm. which really is not much of an NDA. It's not what you really want. <laughs> Would you still work with them or not? Well, you're, you're in essence, what you just said is, what if they hand me a basket that's got both apples and oranges in it, right? A patent is intellectual property given, granted by the U.S. government. You could be at any stage of that process, and they have no choice but to represent that, right? To, to, to respect that, right? An NDA is a, a letter contract between you and them, and it's for confidentiality, which is entirely different than patentability. And so what you're really saying to them is, look, I don't have a patent. I expect you not to tell people. And they're saying, okay, I won't tell people, or no, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna not tell people. Right, they're two different animals entirely. So, we're gonna wait for their response, and how they respond is largely gonna dictate what we do next. Now, just because they don't sign the NDA doesn't mean you can't work with them. You might choose to still work with them, but that's your decision, you have to make that decision. Eventually, you are going to get a licensing contract. I all but guarantee it. Because this is a process. And we're gonna do the process over and over again until we get good at it, and eventually you will get a licensing contract. When that happens, you have to fully understand the terms in that contract. Now, if you've been doing this and you're on your 20th licensing contract, pretty much, you're going to see a lot of the same stuff over and over again. But at least for your first few licensing contracts, you should be working with an attorney. An attorney is there to help you. Now, how many people would take their licensing contract to their patent attorney? That's like taking your dog to your dentist. With all difference to my good friends in the patent attorney business, they're not contract attorneys. Contract law is different than patent law. I wouldn't take my, my patent needs to my contract attorney. Find yourself one of each. Someone who can handle your intellectual property issues and someone who can work with you in, in negotiating a contract. There are certain things that go into these contracts that should be there. But if your attorney has never licensed anything in terms of retail products, he's probably not going to know how much of that works. So you're going to have to dig in and find some things. Each one of these contracts should have these three pillars. We have the pillar that says, I want some upfront money. Why do we want upfront money? Why should the manufacturer have to pay us upfront money? So they're committed. So they're committed? Because depending on how complicated your product is, it might take a year and a half ever to see a store shelf. That's a lot of opportunity loss. Because the minute, the minute I sign this contract with this person and somebody walks in and hands me a giant bag of money for my idea, I gotta say no. Because I've already signed the contract. So this upfront money could come in a couple of different ways. Often, inventors will do it as an advance on their royalties. 
but you don't have to do it as an advance on your royalty. It's like earnest money. Show me you're serious. Show me you've got what it takes and give me enough money in this contract that if two months from now somebody comes along and offers me a bag of money and I got to turn them down, I don't feel so bad. That's business. Oftentimes we recommend to inventors that they exercise options. You can do an option on an invention, a licensed invention all the time, just like a, an author does it or a playwright does an option. You see somebody come out with a good book, I guarantee there's half a dozen movie companies that are optioning that book. And what they're saying is, I'll give you a bunch of money for the right to use, turn that book into a, into a, a movie anytime within the next 12 months. If at the end of 12 months, I've decided not to make a movie out of it, you're still keeping the money. Options are very normal. They're, they're done with, with creative stuff all the time. I've used them in licensing. They're a good tool. They're basically saying, I gotta sit around and wait on you to get your act together before I could make any money. That's worth something to me. Your royalty payment. How much should a royalty payment be? Anybody? In a, as a function of percentage? 90%. 90%? That's what it should be. Let me know if you get that kind of deal. 5%? Huh? 5%? So there is what's called a national royalty guide, and your contract attorney will have this. It's a book. And it lays out what all the royalty guides are for everything from music to books to whatever. And the average royalty across the board is eight points, eight percent. That's the average. Now, let's put that in perspective for you. I've done licensing deals where I got 10 percent. I've never seen a licensing deal above 10 percent. I've seen lots of licensing deals right around 6%, which is where most of them will fall. Except if you're doing an as seen on TV product where the licensing will be down around 2.5%. But the volumes will be much greater. If I've got a really good product that I'm selling at Target, I can expect to sell a million, million two pieces a year. If I've got a really great ad seen on TV product, I could sell four million pieces a month. So the volumes are drastically different, but so are the royalty rates. Now, what's the biggest factor in royalty? How good you are. How well you position these people. I always laugh one time this guy sent me a 20 or 32 page PowerPoint presentation on his baby bib wanting me to license it from him, which I don't do. I don't license things from inventors, but somehow he thought I did. So he sent me this big PowerPoint. He's a PhD. And he's got this baby bib, 32 pages of a PowerPoint. <laughs> At the end of the PowerPoint, he told me I could make 34.7% profit. Now, obviously his PhD isn't in business because he would have no way of knowing my profit because he doesn't know what my GNA is. He has no idea what my expenses are. He has no idea what it will cost to even make that baby bit. How could, he, how could he ever compute profit? He couldn't. So what did that tell me about this guy? He was a really smart, dumb guy. Because I knew there was no way he could come up with that number, so he spent 32 pages trying to sell me on why I should do it. I threw the whole thing in the garbage, as anyone would. Because he didn't tell me the one thing I really wanted to know. How many other baby bibs are there? What neighborhood am I going to live in? Do, the, do the, the community really need more baby bibs? What's yours doing better than theirs? He didn't tell me any of that. Because he didn't think that's what I wanted to hear. But it is what I wanted to hear because as soon as it was done, I was going to have to go and do all that work. So the more of that work you do, the more you understand what that licensing company is going to be going through once you sign a deal, the more respect they have for you. The more they will be likely to sign your NDAs, the more they will answer your phone calls, 
the more they will say, hey, you know what? We really need a new pizza cutter. Call that guy Joe who's always bringing us stuff. See if he can come up with something for a pizza cutter. And then you're on your way to becoming a professional for hire inventor. And that's what this process goes, but you've got to earn your stripes. You've got to get their respect. And you get their respect by understanding the world that they're going to live in. And that drives your royalty rate. Performance guarantee is the third pillar of any licensing contract. So anybody have any idea what the one of the biggest distinctions is of the Disney company? They're known for licensing products so they can keep them off the market. They try and snap up all this technology for the sole purpose of keeping competitors from getting it. I guarantee it happens in our industry as well. And the only way you can guard against it is by having performance guarantees. That says to me, I don't care if you sell one or a million. I'm getting paid for this, no matter what you do. Now, it's their right once they control that product, once they control your invention. It's their right to do with it what they want. If you don't have a performance guarantee built into your license contract, they can throw it in a drawer. And you're going to think that 10 years license deal they gave you was huge until you realize why they really gave it to you. So that's basically minimum uh, payment. It is. So how do we calculate that? One of the things that most inventors never do is check out these companies to see what kind of distribution channels they have. Because I guarantee these companies all talk big. But do they really have distribution? And without distribution, the product's going nowhere. No matter whether they license it to you or not. So what we look for in minimum performance is a percentage of possible distribution. So I'm gonna license my thing to company X and company X sells to Home Depot and Home Depot has 700 stores. Now how many, how many units on an average product, not milk or, or consumables like that, but an average product, a retailer like a Home Depot, or let me, I'll use one that, that I know. I used to invent for Prim Dritz. Prim Dritz does quilting and sewing out of Spartanburg, South Carolina biggest quilting and sewing company in the, the world. And I used to invent quilting and sewing products for them. I can tell you that in our distribution for quilting and sewing in Hobby Lobby, they would sell maybe a product, a product and a half per week across 700 stores. So that's maybe 1,100 pieces a week. So if I know that, then I can extrapolate that into how much distribution this company should be able to get. And my minimum performance can be about 60-70% of that. Not 100%, but 60-70%. And I can do that. Oh, you sell to Home Depot, you sell to Lowe's, you sell to Menards, you know, like products, similar products in those stores are moving a piece and a half a week. Now just do the math. You'll figure out pretty closely what it's going to do. Now, how do you know they're moving a piece and a half a week? Well, you got to get creative. So you might walk in and ask for the store manager and you might say, hey, look, I'm an inventor and I'm trying to figure this stuff out. Could you run a movement report on this SKU for me? Because this SKU is the closest to, the, to your product. And they'll most of the time go, sure. And they'll run the report. It's called a movement report. And what it is, is a number of pieces that went across the scanner. And they'll go, oh, well that sold three pieces last week. Or it's averaging 1.7 pieces a week. Oh, okay, great. Well, your product's going to probably do pretty close to that. So now you've got something to start with the math. Now you've got some way to start calculating what this company you're licensing to should be able to do in performance. You need to understand this reality. 
Most of the time you will fail. Say it with me. I'm going to fail. Come on. I'm going to fail. We're going to fail. Most of the time we're going to fail. That is the reality of this. No matter how long you've been doing it, you will always fail far more than you will succeed. You have to embrace that. You have to understand that because otherwise it will beat you down. And you can't let it beat you down. Just because you get a deal doesn't mean anything. It's true. There's a lot of ways that deal can go south. A lot of ways. The better you did your job, the more they will respect you. And the more they will respect you, the better deal you will get. That's a simple concept, isn't it? They do their job every day. They had to get good at their jobs. They expect us to do the same thing. Protect your invention the best you can, but not having a patent is not a deal breaker. No matter what some goof with a you know, some self-proclaimed expert may tell you, it's not a deal breaker. People license unpatented products all the time. So let's do the math here. Understanding what a good product is, well that's free. Conducting a market audit, well wait, that's free too. If you have someone do a search for previous patents for you, you might spend a hundred bucks doing a rudimentary search. You're not doing a deep dive. If you learn what a good search is, then you can do it yourself. Have a rendering done. This got all messed up. Study the terms and the process. That's free. Have a rendering done. If you want your sales sheet to look even reasonably professional, have a rendering done. It's no big deal. There's a great lady, her name's Lisa Fargo. Lisa Fargo's out of Pittsburgh. And she does sell sheets for inventors and packaging and all kinds of stuff. She's a great resource, she's very good at what she does and she's very inexpensive. And I send inventors to her all the time because she will do a template sell sheet for you. Which means you're going to get a template and you're going to be able to plug in the stuff for each one of your ideas without having to pay to have a sell sheet done every time. Most of this stuff is relatively free. And if you did a provisional patent application on your own, which we said was really just a, a tool to build a little value, if you're planning on licensing your thing, your invention to a manufacturer and you go out and get a utility patent, you're a moron. I mean, really. Make them pay for that. Get the cheapest form of protection you can and let them pay for it. Negotiate it into your license deal. If their attorneys really think they need it, let them pay for it. You're still going to be the inventor on it. Paying for the patent doesn't make you the inventor. You can see most of this stuff is really inexpensive. So I hear this all the time. Oh, I really want to license my thing, but I need to get an investor. Why? I have friends in the business that license professionally. It's all they do, and they never spend more than 50 or 100 bucks on any of it. Because you don't have to. If you take the time to learn the processes. So we're going to do these steps. We're going to find a good solution to a big problem, right? Because a good solution to a small problem doesn't give you commercial viability. A good solution to a big problem gives you commercial viability. We're going to understand the core function of your product or idea, because that's going to help us make a good product. We're going to make sure you know what makes a good product. We're going to understand the principles of benefit and detriment, the consumer workaround the, the uh, consumer use cycle, the value index, all these things that are tools that we use to understand why consumers embrace some products and not others. We're going to conduct a market audit to see if the world really needs one. 
And we're going to be honest enough with ourselves with that answer. We're going to protect the idea the best and the cheapest way we can. We're going to produce a quick manufacturer sell sheet. We're going to go shopping for contacts. Respectfully, we're going to contact these manufacturers. That's a really, really important part. I've been doing this a lot of years. I'm tired of dealing with nut jobs. We don't have to be nut jobs, and we don't have to be seen by the world as nut jobs. We just have to be respectful and dial down the emotion a little bit. We have to understand what we're signing, and we do that by contacting an attorney who went to law school, not somebody you met on a forum somewhere. And then we're going to repeat these steps over and over again. Because this is a process. And I don't care what widget you put in it. The process doesn't change. We just do it over and over until we get good at it. Because repetition gives us efficiency. And efficiency leads to profitability. In all things, all things. This is really important. And it is not rocket science. This is really a really important statement. I say this all the time. How many of you have assigned your patents? It's on your shirt. It's on your shirt, man. How many of you? It's, I live in South Carolina. Every animal indigenous to the state of South Carolina is trying to kill you. <laughs> Anyone here ever assigned their patents in a licensing deal? You have. Edison Nation, right? Edison Nation? You assigned them? So, when we talk about assigning a patent, we're talking about formally and legally changing the ownership of that patent. There is only one way, known to man, to change officially the ownership of a patent, and that's through assignment. If I leave you my patent in my will, it does not give you ownership. If I write an IOU in a bar, it does not give you ownership. If I have a big contract drawn up saying you now own my patent, it does not give you ownership. There is only one way to change ownership of a U.S. patent, and that is an assignment at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office and the registration of that assignment. That's it. If you don't do that, you did not change the ownership. However, if you did do that, you did change the ownership. There is no reason to ever assign a patent as part of a licensing process. None. Because the licensing contract is a pseudo-assignment. It's rental. I leased you the right to do this. Okay, if I go and rent a house, does the landlord sign the deed over to me? No. We sign a contract that gives the terms by which I'm going to rent the property. That's all a licensing agreement is. So why would you sign the deed? That makes no sense. There's only two companies that I'm aware of in the U.S. in our industry that force assignments of patents. One is Quirky and the other is Edison Nation. What about uh, the... the Leasing exclusively and non-exclusive. So, if I'm a company and I'm working in sporting goods, and you have a tape that you invented, some kind of an adhesive tape, and you want to license it to me, you're going to license it to me for use in sporting goods. I'm not going to own the right to do what I want to do with that in automotive. So we license excuse me, we license in verticals. So you decide what vertical that company has distribution in and that's the parameter of your license deal. So it is exclusive in the fact that I'm not going to sign this deal with you if you're trying to peddle it to three of my competitors. Okay, so you're only going to get one person in sporting goods. But you can get one person in sporting goods and turn right around and license it to someone in automotive. That's not competitive in nature, it's done all the time. 
a question for you. Back yes. to this Edison Nation deal. So what, what are they trying to accomplish by having it uh, signed? Well, I don't work at Edison Nation, so I can't tell you like, anything but more than my theory on that. Would it possibly, just as a theory, would it possibly be that once the, let's say there's a term for this licensing agreement, let's say it expires, then theoretically they own the patent. Mm -hmm. If you've done the assignment, they own the patent. The only way you're going to get them to change ownership of the patent back to you yeah. is to ask them or to sue them or to create some kind of a contract where they agree to do it. But even then, if they say, oh, well, we know we said we would, but we're not going to, the only recourse you have is to sue them. That's why assigning patents in licensing deals makes no sense. Companies often, and I, I don't know Edison Nation, their inner workings or their motivations. Same with Corky. I know that both companies are heavily invested. That means they have big people with big money they put into these. Oftentimes patents are used as to collateralize those investments. And so when you get them and you all of a sudden have control ownership of a thousand patents, that looks pretty good to an investor. So if I were building a company like that and that was my motivation, I would definitely think about that. Um, if, you, if you do this, if you make that assignment and licensing, it's your right to do it. You own the patent. If you choose to do it for whatever also reason, you do it. They say, yeah, we own X number of patents. When if they didn't do that, they can only say we're licensing. So it, it just kind of, it, I can see how that would, yeah. So in Edison Nation's case, and I've written about this several times, it's in their terms and conditions. So not only when you hit enter at 3 o'clock in the morning, it appears from their terms and conditions on their website that not only do they now own the right to all your intellectual property, or the right to go to the patent office and make an assignment, they also are now your power of attorney. Which is, in my opinion, strictly my opinion, an even more dangerous position. But, don't click on things at 3 o'clock in the morning that you haven't had your attorney read. That's the moral of that story. In your experience with all the licensing deals that you've done, have any of the manufacturers that you've gone to asked just to buy it outright as opposed to licensing them? I have not. I've never had that. I've never really let them know that I was, I was interested in doing that anyway. Uh, mainly because even though we call it this technology, it can often be used in a lot of different verticals. And so you're never going to, if they buy it outright, then they own all those verticals. You can't buy half a patent or half an idea. So, so it's almost short-sighted if you do that because you don't know when the technology is going to be transferable to a different vertical. This is a really important thing because we're seeing more and more inventors fall prey to this as companies are using these large patent portfolios as monetary instruments. And, and this can apply. I mean, you may have had your patent for five or six years. And now all of a sudden, because you didn't read the document, all of a sudden someone else has a right to it. And that's not to say these companies do it in every case. There's just no reason to give them the right to do it. It doesn't make sense. InventorOpinion.com is a daily inventor education blog. Been writing this blog for eight years now, Monday through Friday. It's over 1,500 articles. On the right hand side, you will see a keyword search box. Search on these terms, right? Go in there, punch it in, and see the articles that pop up on these things that you have questions about. It's free, no one's ever going to charge you a penny for it. And there's a lot of good information in there that can save you a lot of problems. There's also a Facebook group for the Inventor blog where you can ask questions and people will get on there and answer them. We monitor it very closely so no one's ever going to sell you anything on that group. Nobody's ever going to put out information that isn't, isn't accurate because we, we make sure that nobody does that. And, and it's really important. But there's several patent attorneys that hang out in that group. There's several professional inventors that hang out in the group and answer questions. And, and we try and make 
all this education very safe for you and, and poignant to what you're going through. Because at the end of the day, we as inventors, when we crash that plane, our family's sitting in the back seat. They want to support us. And they're the first ones who will lie to us. They'll tell us how smart we are and how great that was. Because they love us. So it's our, it's our responsibility to know what we're doing. Whether you get that because you come to a group like this or because you read a blog article or whatever, it doesn't make any difference. We just try and make sure that the information is out there for you. Well, Mark, thank you very much for coming. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. I hope you know a little more going out than you knew coming in. <laughs> <laughs>